introduction of you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning to Mederick and Robert in the U.S. And it's really nice to have you guys tonight with all of these uh, challenges that's happening around us. And for the information of our attendees, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Madary Hall, and Dr. Robert Monaco is still in the in the in the uh, audience, and uh, he will be the one to speak tomorrow instead. So Dr. Madary Hall would uh, would be the one talking today. So let me just give an introduction. Uh, Dr. Madary Hall is a sports medicine physician who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of tendon disorders and other sport-related muscles. Excuse me, Dr. Jim, I think you're on mute. He is also doing a lot of procedures. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can, Dr. Jim. Yes, we can. Can, I, can, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Jim, we can hear you now. Okay. And then he has published over 40 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters from different uh, journals. And uh, Dr. Hall is a team physician for the University of Iowa Hawkeyes, the U.S. Ski Team, and the USA Triathlon. And he regularly volunteers his time and expertise in the care of Team USA athletes across multiple sports, including coverage of international competitions. He has also served two terms in the Board of Directors for the American S Medical Society for Sports Medicine. He is the current chair of the Sports Ultrasound Committee for the AMSSM. And of course, uh, not to mention, he came from the University of Notre Dame and Medical School at the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Chicago. So we are so privileged to have him tonight. And he is a physical medicine rehabilitation uh, and also sports medicine fellowship in uh, Mayo Clinic. And that is the reason maybe why the Dr. John Finoff always uh, mentions Dr. Medrick Hall to all of us. So before we begin, uh, we will have a short prayer. Dr. Medrick Hall, so we'll just have to uh, bow our heads for prayer. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, oh God, for the opportunity that we can listen to great speakers tonight. We would like, Lord, to thank you for your grace and your goodness Kindly, Lord, be with us and give us wisdom from thee, and may this be a productive meeting for all of us. We ask, Lord, for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Dr. Medrick Hall, it's all yours now. All right. Well, thanks again for, uh, for inviting me, and hopefully we'll uh, have some fun talking about some muscle injuries uh, here, I guess, this evening for you guys. It's bright and early for me uh, here in the U.S. So, um, I have a, a ton of slides, and so we can be a little bit flexible in terms of how, what we cover and how we move through this. And so I've got the, the chat box open, so if you have any questions or, uh, or comments, feel free to throw them in the chat box. Um, or if you want to just, just chime in, um, you know, we can certainly make this somewhat informal as well. So any questions that come up or clarifications, um, just go ahead and let me know. Um, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, there is a, a webinar I gave on uh, some hamstring injuries from a few years ago that is available through AIUM. So if folks have seen that, we can go through some of the, the similar content pretty quickly. Um, and then I can certainly make these slides available uh, later for folks as well to review just on some of the, you know, the anatomy um, and things. We can get into some, some maybe different information that uh, we haven't covered before. So, uh, a few disclosures, none are really relevant to, uh, to what we're going to be talking about with muscle injury today. Um, what we're hoping to do is, is be able to describe a scanning protocol for assessing hamstring muscle injury. Uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, grading muscle injury, which is fairly confusing, um, and, and talk a little bit about at least the skills that we're using now and how to apply those. Um, we're going to talk about the complexity and importance of intramuscular tendons. Um, and then talk a bit about this utility of serial ultrasound and helping with managing a return to play following acute muscle injury. So we'll start up at the proximal hamstring tendon complex because you know as you're evaluating this is a good area to start just to to orient yourself and so this is an area that I'll always start with uh, for any of my muscle scans and so 
uh, it can be a bit confusing when you're trying to tackle uh, particularly the posterior thigh. Um, and so you need to have a home base that you can start on that then you can quickly orient from. And so, so proximally using this, we call the hyperchoic triangle of, of Cohen is probably you're gonna be your most reliable landmark. You know, you can place your transducer in a short axis or, or axial plane just below the gluteal fold. Um, you're gonna find three hyperchoic structures. And so uh, you'll see the conjoint tendon will sit most superficial uh, then medially, you'll have the semimembranosus tendon, and laterally, you'll have the sciatic nerve. And so if you can find this area, um, then it's going to make your, your scanning much easier. And then what I'll typically do is, is from here, just isolate one muscle at a time, and then just work my way proximal to distal. And that way, you're not going to miss anything uh, as you're going through your scan. So the other thing to, to note here is that the semimembranosus or semitendinosus muscle uh, is always going to be your most proximal muscle. And so you're going to see a large uh, amount of muscle here at this level that's all going to be semitendinosus. Uh, and typically at the triangle, you actually won't even have any biceps femoris muscle. So this will be gluteus maximus over here because uh, the biceps has already turned completely into tendon at this level. So from there, we'll want to follow the tendons up uh, to the ischial tuberosity. And so this is where there's a lot of fancy transducer manipulation um, to try to stay um, on the tendons and, and eliminate anisotropy because the tendons are moving a fair amount here. And so, um, so this is where it can get a bit confusing. But as you scan back and forth from that region up to the uh, origin of the ischial tuberosity, you can maintain both the conjoint tendon component and the semimembranosus tendon component. So we'll come up, we'll see the membranosus is gonna swing um, deep, which is anterior here, uh, and sit a little bit lateral on the ischial tuberosity within the conjoint tendon sitting a bit uh, more medial and, and superficial or posterior. Uh, the long axis view, again, the thing to note here, um, which sometimes trips people up, is again, how far distal the gluteus maximus muscle comes. And so we can see the ischial tuberosity here. Here's our long axis view of the, the proximal hamstring. Um, and this entire region is covered by the gluteus maximus. And so um, I don't, don't let that confuse you, um, you know, on the, on the sonographic evaluation or really even on your physical exam. Some people don't appreciate um, that, you know, how high or how proximal the hamstring tendon origin really is in relation to the gluteus maximus. Uh, so, so these anatomy slides, we're going to go relatively quickly through. As I mentioned, we, we've, I've got another talk um, you know, that's available. Uh, and, and some of this is just looking through the, the slides and just becoming familiar. But, but we'll try to hit the highlights in terms of the, of the anatomy here. And so as I mentioned um, before, the conjoint tendon and semimembranosus typically can be identified, um, the separate components at the ischial tuberosity. Um, Obviously, if you're scanning in, in larger individuals um, or non-athletes, this can become quite challenging. And so all my pictures here are going to be, a, you know, thin fit young individuals. And so in that population, you can actually get, uh, you know, very good views of all of these things. And so, you know, traditionally, uh, MRI has been thought to be, you know, far superior for evaluation here. And I would say in the general population, um, you know, that's certainly true. But in, in healthy athletes, we can usually get, uh, you know, quite good images um, and detailed tendon pathology fairly well. Um, so again, the, the, the tendon, the, the key here really is going to be this dynamic component of watching the tendons come off the ischial tuberosity and then starting to form. And that's what we're doing here uh, as we're just coming down. We'll see the conjoint tendon here, semimembranosus tendon here. And so you'll want to spend time just going proximal and distal and watching the tendons uh, insert and then watching them uh, as they come distally um, and start to form their myotendinous junctions um, to make sure that you're appreciating any, any relevant pathology in the area. Uh, I'll just briefly mention the, the ischiochondylar origin of the adductor magnus because this is something just to be, uh, be aware of th that, it, that it exists and not let it confuse you as you're scanning around the area, particularly if you're encountering, encountering pathology. And so there is a relatively large tendon of the adductor magnus. This is sometimes referred to as the mini hamstring tendon. And it's going to sit on the ischial tuberosity as well. So we can see here in short axis, 
and then in long axis, this uh, small mini hamstring that's inserting onto the ischial tuberosity. Um, this is easy to find because we'll just move from the, the hyperechoic triangle, we'll, we'll run the sinew loop back here again, we'll find the semi-membranosis, which is here. If we move medially, we'll see another hyperechoic structure that then we can follow proximally to the ischial tuberosity. And so it's relatively straightforward. It just ends up being fairly uh, far medial compared to where we're usually at on the lateral aspect of the ischial tuberosity with the, uh, the hamstring tendon complex proper. Um, so just something to be aware of uh, and is worthwhile practicing scanning. You can actually see isolated pathology here, um, but the other pitfall would be, um, you know, miscalling a complete tendon avulsion, thinking it's partial um, when in fact the only tendon that's on is the adductor magnus. That's going to be a different situation um, than a true one tendon uh, avulsion of the, of the actual hamstring tendon complex itself. Uh, these are just some gross anatomy slides just to help with understanding the, the positioning here. Um, essentially, the adductor magnus uh, tendon is just going to lie medial and a bit inferior on the issue of tuberosity. So, so it makes sense, um, you know, based on where you're scanning at. It just takes a little bit of practice um, to, to figure out where these areas are uh, in relation to the, the usual uh, region and the lateral aspect that you're used to looking at. All right, so, so here's just an example uh, of an acute hamstring avulsion in an athlete. And, and as I was saying, in these you know, thin young athletes, um, you can actually get beautiful images. And so this was one of our uh, Olympic wrestlers who had um, a complete hamstring uh, tendon avulsion. And so you can see the gluteus maximus here again. Here's the ischial tuberosity. You see this large um, anechoic uh, fluid defect within the hamstring tendon on the long axis image here. And then on the short axis, we can see this you know, characteristic uh, appearance of this uh, detentioned tendon. So we can see um, the, uh, you know, the tendon starts to retract and pull back a bit and you get this um, you know, kind of balled up appearance on the short axis um, with some hyperechogenicity representing edema and then the anechoic uh, free fluid hematoma that's surrounding the region. All right, we, we'll, we'll zip through this and get into the muscle eval. Um, but just to remember, you know, this would be a situation of acute hamstring avulsion uh, in an athlete. This is going to be, you know, chronic tendinosis, which usually has a much different uh, clinical picture. And then you can certainly get um, acute tears on chronic tears, but again, much different clinical picture. So this was an older uh, recreational athlete who had longstanding ischial tuberosity pain within some acute worsening. And we can see a lot of cortical irregularity along the ischial tuberosity, which is signs of chronic tendinosis. Uh, there's some calcification within the tendon, and then there's a re region uh, within the middle of the tendon of an intrasubstance tear, um, but this is really more on the, on the line of high-grade tendinosis as opposed to our athlete with the acute mechanism and the true tendon avulsion. Uh, here's just some examples of some, some isolated pathology at the adductor magnus, just again, something to add to your differential diagnosis. Um, you know, particularly of sitting related pain. Um, I find this to be um, more common with patients who come in with, with sitting related pain as opposed to activity related pain. Um, and oftentimes this gets misdiagnosed as, a, as an ischial bursitis, um, when in fact it's probably more of a tendinopathy. Uh, and then the last thing proximally here, just to be aware of as well, is the, the membranous injury uh, of the semimembranosis. And so uh, semimembranosis is very interesting. Uh, it has this, you know, the, the tendon and then has a long membrane before uh, and, uh, the muscle actually forms at the myotendinous junction. And so this functions somewhat as, as a tendon. Um, and so injury to this area, which, which we'll see not infrequently, um, does tend to have a bit worse prognosis or at least a bit longer recovery period um, than a straight muscle injury. And so this, in my mind, behaves more, um, you know, like a hybrid zone, more, more tending towards a tendinous injury as opposed to a muscular injury. And so it's important to pick up. And, and again, if you're not looking for this, um, it's something you can easily, uh, easily blow over. And so this is going to be semi-tendinosis muscle here, and this is going to be the membranous portion of the membranosis as it slides underneath. And so we can see um, in the small little, uh, little calcification here, we can see the thickening of the, of the region, and this is going to be the adductor magnus sitting here below. 
All right, so we'll move on to the muscles, um, which is what we really want to talk about today. And, and these are slides, um, again, that are available elsewhere. And so this is just kind of taking you through each individual um, zone of the thigh as you walk down with correlative uh, um, cadaveric specimens. And so, so what, I'll, what I'll tell you is, as we already mentioned, you know, you need to start with, the, with, with some, somewhere where you can uh, reliably reproduce the image so that you could orient. And so the hyperchoic triangle is perfect. From that zone, you can quickly evaluate the hamstring tendon complex, make sure there's not an injury there. Then I will usually just pick one muscle at a time and then, and then scan from proximal to distal. So we'll start with, say, the biceps, scan biceps, long head, short head, all the way down to the knee, come back, scan semi-tendinosis, scan that all the way down, then come over, scan semi-membranosis, and scan that all the way down, and then do any focal uh, evaluations in zones of pain. So you can get, you know, injuries to the gracilis, say, or some of these lesser muscles um, at times. And so I'll usually let the clinical exam, um, you know, dictate uh, further evaluation outside of the core hamstring muscles uh, in those scenarios. And so as we, as we um, start proximally, you know, just off of the tendon, the first muscle you're going to see is going to be the semitendinosis. And so that's, you know, that's going to sit up there every time. Some semitendinosis will often have uh, muscular attachments directly to the ischial tuberosity or even the sacred tuberous ligament. So you'll have muscle that's quite high here, um, and that helps you quickly uh, orient to the semitendinosis. Um, so as we start to move down distally, then we'll see the biceps femoris form. And so don't get confused, you know, proximally the gluteus maximus is going to be the first muscle that you're seeing laterally. Um, you want to come down and really confirm the true myotendinous junction of the biceps femoris um, before you start to look for pathology there. And oftentimes it's a bit further distal than, uh, than you may appreciate given the size of the semitendinosis. So then as we start to, to come down, we'll, we'll see that membranous portion that we were just talking about uh, of the semimembranosis. And then the uh, muscle tendon junction is going to form here. We'll see the semimembranosis muscle kind of forming here, which is medial to the tendinosis. And so we'll follow that membrane as it moves across and then gets to the true uh, myotendinous junction here. So as we're on the upper thigh, uh, we'll see the vast majority of the muscle bulk is going to be your tendinosis. Membranosis is just barely forming, uh, and the biceps femoris is starting to get to enlarge and is, you know, a decent sized muscle here, uh, but, but still smaller than the semitendinosis. As we move into the mid thigh, um, the tendinosis is starting to decrease, the biceps is getting bigger, the semimembranosis is getting bigger, and the muscles are relatively um, symmetric in, in terms of volume size uh, <clears throat> at this point. As we start to come further distal, we'll see the origin of the short head of the biceps, and so this is an important area to recognize as well, and we'll mention uh, these T-junction injuries in a moment, uh, but this is a, a spot of uh, a particular pathology that you want to evaluate for within the biceps. And so as we scan down, we'll see the long head here, it gets smaller, we'll see the short head arise, and then the, the long head will get smaller and smaller as the short head gets larger as we move towards the knee um, and starts to form the, uh, the tendon. The other thing that you'll see coming in view here will be the lateral gastroc muscle. And so as the, the, short, the long head starts to form into the tendon, the short head gets bigger, and then another muscle will pop up, which will be the lateral gastroc, um, which, which shouldn't confuse you. Um, the other thing to, to note as you start to move down is you'll see this interesting hyperechoic uh, veil or raphase, they'll call it, um, moving across the semi-T. And so this is an interesting structure. Um, I don't think we fully understand what the biomechanical properties or reason uh, for this but um, this is a very easy way to quickly identify the semitendinosis. And so um, no other muscle has this uh, appearance. And this will be, you'll see this all the time as it kind of moves across the screen. So kind of a peculiar finding, um, essentially a, a help, very helpful landmark in identifying the, the muscle at that level. All right, so as we move to the lower thigh, you know, our big bulk of muscle now is going to be actually the semimembranosis. The semitendinosis is going to start uh, moving superficial to form the, the tendon, which is going to sit, which you're all aware of in the, in the posterior aspect of the knee. Um, the biceps short head is now uh, a large muscle as well, and the long head is, is starting to move towards its uh, muscle tendon junction. 
This is the area within the, the biceps, long head, short head, um, T-junction zone that I mentioned. And so uh, this you know, should look very familiar to you, similar to the uh, gastroc and soleus arrangement in the lower leg. And so there's this aponeurosis that runs between these two muscles. And this is a zone where you can get injury. Uh, and again, this is one of the, the areas we'll look for that tends to have a bit worse prognosis uh, and have longer recovery. And so this is gonna be an athlete with, with distal lateral pain. Um, and what you'll often see is disinsertion of these muscle fibers from the long head off of this aponeurosis. And when that happens, they detension and you'll end up getting some retraction and some hematoma and fluid down here. And because the, the structure is really disrupted and those fibers um, will actually disinsert and pull off, um, that's why these end up taking a bit longer. They're, they're not really held together um, in a place for optimal healing. And so, so these are, are ones that we'll typically watch a bit closer um, and expect to have a longer return to play. All right, this is just getting very low now, and this is this is really um, going to be the posterior knee at this point. And so uh, we're seeing semi-tendinosis. Uh, tendon is actually forming here. Um, the, the biceps muscle is really starting to go towards its muscle tendon junction. The gastroc is making up a larger portion of the actual muscle um, at this level. So just the things you should be very familiar with and comfortable with. And so you have to be able to quickly find all of these landmarks. Otherwise, it can be really difficult to call pathology um, as you're trying to move through the thigh. And so you want to be able to orient off the triangle proximally. Um, you want to be very comfortable with that, with that um, membranous portion of the semimembranosis and its usual movement um, underneath of the tendinosis uh, to its myotendinous junction medial. The, the veil of the semi-T is very helpful uh, in quickly orienting on that muscle. Um, the distal biceps tendon is, is uh, again, an area to view in both, both that myotendinous, um, uh, or the, the, the aponeurosis at the long head short head, and then the myotendinous junction, uh, particularly of the long head as it comes down. And then the semitendinosis is another very helpful landmark, far distal because it sits most superficial. And this is one that you're probably used to looking at with your posterior knee evaluation and, and a standard reference point for Baker's cyst evaluation. Um, so that's another helpful landmark there. So if you know these and can confidently pick these off, um, then you're gonna be able to quickly orient to the area of pathology as you're trying to, to call uh, acute muscle injury. All right, so let's move into muscle injury grading and injury patterns. And so um, when, you're, when you're trying to identify pathology here, you know, the best way to do this is gonna to be to, to evaluate in the short axis. And so uh, I, I prefer to start proximally you know, at the ischial tuberosity and then just pick a muscle and move um, proximal to distal and then scan every muscle that way. That way I ensure I have a, a pretty standard protocol. I'm not missing any pathology. Um, short axis is going to be the, the best survey um, plane, but then we want to always confirm in the long axis as well. And then we want to get measurements in the long axis in terms of the longitudinal um, involvement. Sometimes that can be difficult because a lot of these muscle injuries may extend, um, you know, 15 centimeters or so in that plane. And so what you, you have two options in terms of that. One is if you have an extended field of view option on your ultrasound unit, then you can capture an extended field of view uh, image. The other option, if you don't have that, or, or if it's, it's difficult to stay in plane, is you can actually mark on the skin uh, in the short axis, the proximal and distal extents, and then just measure um, on the skin. And so sometimes that, that actually may be more reliable if you're trying to get um, you know, a true measurement of the longitudinal involvement. Um, other thing to consider is the timing of the scan. And so if you scan these muscle injuries too early, um, you can get a false negative. And so, um, you know, we will scan some of these athletes straight off the field at this point. Um, and, you know, it, it's very unreliable. Um, I've seen injuries that, you know, at one or two hours after they've happened, really not look that bad. And then if I scan them, you know, two days later, it, it looks horrible. And I've upped the grade like two grades. 
And so, so I'm very hesitant and honestly, I, I don't find a whole lot of utility in scanning these straight off the, the pitch or straight off the field. Um, at this point, I usually like to wait at least 36 hours, um, you know, but a couple days is going to be probably optimal. Um, and this allows for, you know, hematoma to establish, um, you know, some of the, um, uh, the findings to really come out. And, um, you know, and I think if you do scan right away, that, that's fine, um, but you really have to do follow-up scans, um, you know, particularly if the injury doesn't look that bad, um, you're always going to want to confirm that before moving forward with, um, with information that really may not be true. Um, based on MRI data, you know, scanning with any, at any point within that first week is probably going to give you um, pretty consistent information. And so um, my guess is that that's fairly similar for ultrasound as well. Uh, but again, 36 to 48 hours is what I, what I prefer for my optimal. Um, Doppler, I find, is very helpful here. We'll talk about this uh, in a moment regarding how we'll use this to, to follow and assist with return to play. But this is one of the things that, that ultrasound has that MRI may not. And so I think um, it's something to get familiar with um, and, and familiar with what normal Doppler flow looks like in the muscle, because muscle's obviously gonna have, um, especially in athletes, is gonna have a fair amount of normal Doppler flow, but the pattern's gonna be slightly different from what we would consider normal versus abnormal. So it's something just to get comfortable with. Um, anisotropy, just in like in tendon imaging, is going to be um, you know significant with muscle Im uh, imaging as well. And anisotropy in muscle typically is going to mimic edema within muscle. And so you have to be very careful um, that you're not overcalling um, uh, edema when it's just really anisotropy. Uh, and then the last uh, general consideration here is just that classification is very confusing. And so we'll go into that in a minute, but I hope to at least make, uh, make, make things a little bit more clear in terms of what, what we're doing anyways uh, for muscle injury classification. So, so everybody, you know, back in medical school and such, you learned these, you know, grade one, two, and threes, right? Everything had a grade one, two, and three, which is a very simple um, idea in terms of the amount of tearing. And so kind of a little, uh, you know, medium and a lot or complete tearing. Um, but this is really not all that helpful in my mind in terms of muscle injury. Uh, are really a lot of different uh, types of things that we make great on these one, one to three scales. And so you can see these have been used uh, in various um, manners, you know, from the 1960s, you know, through more recently. Uh, in 2013, the Munich consensus statement came out. And this was um, one of the early efforts to try to come up with a better muscle injury grading system. You know, folks who, who do a lot of muscle injury recognize that, you know, the simple grade one, two, and three really, really doesn't provide any meaningful information, um, honestly, in terms of, of getting athletes back to return to play. And so here, you know, they, they came up with a bit more complicated system with A's and B's, um, the one, two, three, um, uh, four, based on, you know, the various various things. They included clinical signs and symptoms and such. Uh, and I don't feel like this was quite as, as helpful, but it was a good start. Um, later, the, the FCB Barcelona uh, system came about, and this is another system that tried to, um, you know, better define some of the injuries. And so looking at uh, the location, so was it in the proximal, medial, or distal aspect of the muscle um, was it a, a tendon tear, a myotendon disjunction tear, or a peripheral tear? And then how big was it? So how much cross-sectional area was involved within the muscle? And then they actually added in uh, injury, uh, re-injury data. So is this a, an initial episode? Is this a recurrent injury? Is this, you know, their fourth uh, re-injury of the same muscle? Uh, and so this provides now a bit more information um, and, and is helpful for us. What what I tend to use um, is the British Athletics uh, Muscle Injury Grading Scale, and um, I find this one probably the most most useful. Um, and some of this maybe I, I did a traveling fellowship in the UK, and so I worked a little bit with these guys. Um, so so that may be a little of my bias as well. But um, but I think this is helpful to look at because it gives us the you know the location. We're talking about, uh, are they myotendinous junctions? Is it myofascial or is it intratendinous? And I think these, these are important considerations because the, the location um, within the muscle, at least in my experience um, in the literature is, is, is controversial, but somewhat supports, may have a change in your, in your prognosis. Uh, and then we'll also have um, 
a, a cross-sectional area and a, a longitudinal length measurement. Um, so you can tell, you know, how big this area is, what's the zone, um, which, I, which I think, you know, at least gets us talking a little bit more practical information. Uh, this is this a, a different way to present this. I know these these slides are super busy, and sometimes it's a little bit intimidating when you look at all of these numbers. So this is just a slightly different way to present the same information, uh, looking at the grading. And so the one through four, uh, actually zero through four, four honestly, um, and kind of looking at thinking about it as small, moderate, extensive, or complete hair, and then the amount of edema. Um, the location, so A, B versus C. So C is going to be in, with intratendinous involvement. Um, B is going to be the myotendinous junction, and then A is going to be myofascial. And then uh, A, B, and C based on architectural disruption. So uh, how much of a fiber gap are you seeing? Are you seeing tendon redundancy for the intratendinous? And, and basically, you will ups, upgrade these. And so you take the, the highest grade um, of any of these components, and that'll be what you'll land on. Uh, as you're trying to apply this. And so all these grading systems are MRI based at this point. And so we don't have, um, you know, great data on ultrasound. Um, yeah, COVID has put a, a bit of a, a hamper on a study that we're trying to do now, but hopefully we will uh, be able to resume this where we're actually trying to look at the uh, reliability and validity of, of ultrasound compared with MRI uh, and actually applying um, these muscle injury grading scales. And so this is something that we're, that we're looking at now. So if I see somebody uh, in clinic, one of my you know, track athletes comes in, um, this is kind of how I'm gonna describe their injury. You know, where's it at? Is it proximal central distal? Um, you know, is it an A, B, or C? So is there tendon involvement? Is this on the periphery? Um, and then how big is it? Um, how much area? How long? Um, how much cross-sectional region? And then we're also looking at, at some of the other things um, that aren't currently on the MRI grading system, but you know, is there vascularity or hyperemia within the muscle? Um, we're looking at fluid collections between muscle planes and, um, and then as well as with the tendon, um, some dynamic components. So is there loss of tension um, and things with, uh, with contraction so that we think might be helpful. So here's just a few uh, examples of the actual classifications. Um, and so this is, this is the one that's tricky. And I think this is where you'll see a lot of variance with, between MRI and ultrasound. So MRI is really great at picking up uh, fluid. And so MRI is gonna pick up subtle muscle edema uh, very well. And it's gonna be much more clear than on ultrasound because you have this issue with the muscle anisotropy. And so um, this is, is what this, um, you know, kind of cloud-like hyperechoic uh, edema will look like. Um, but may I, if I show you a picture of muscle anisotropy, it's going to look really, really close. And so uh, you can see it's subtly different. You have these regions through here. Um, but, but this is probably the area where, uh, where it's most challenging uh, to distinguish. That being said, these are low-grade injuries that typically do very well. So I'm not sure from a clinical perspective, um, you know, it's really all that important. Uh, here's just again a, a, a cine loop that may show some of this uh, superficial edema perhaps a little bit better. Uh, we have both a short axis and long axis view as you come across. And so you can kind of appreciate um, this area through here uh, again, but, but fairly subtle. But the important thing here is that we're seeing intact muscle fibers as they're moving through. And so, um, so, so we're really uh, able to say there's not a truly a structural injury here. And so if you, if you miss some muscle edema, uh, I'm not convinced that's necessarily that important clinically. So here's an example of a grade uh, 1A injury. And so we have a, a small uh, myofascial tear of a semimembranosis. And so uh, we can see this zone right over here um, where we have a little bit of fiber disruption. We can see uh, a small amount of uh, hematoma, which is this anechoic structure right here. Uh, and then on Doppler, which again, I think is very helpful, um, we can see this increased flow all around the area. And honestly, the Doppler uh, here is much more obvious than, the, than just the, the um, grayscale ultrasound. And so this is a, a region we typically wouldn't expect to see flow like this. Um, and, and this is where it's helpful to, to get used to what the normal uh, flow pattern around muscle may look like versus abnormal. 
All right, we'll see a, a bit more um, significant injury now. And this is a very common injury that I will see. And so this is gonna be an intratendinous involvement. And so um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these intramuscular tendons in a, in a moment. Um, but there's, the, there's aponeuroses and, and tendinous structures that run through really the entire length of the muscle. And, and you know, we've, we've become a bit more concerned about injury to these areas. Uh, even to the point of considering early operative intervention um, with involvement. And so here is going to be this, this uh, aponeurosis between the, the biceps and the semitendinosis. And we can see here this muscle injury has really started to involve part of this uh, central tendon of, this, of the uh, semitendinosis here. And so this is how we'll grade this off as a, uh, as a C uh, component where this really starts to abut um, but it's not extended through. So we've not actually gone through that area of the tendon. Um, so this is what's going to give us a grade two. And here's a bit more significant um, injury now where we start to involve more of that tendon. And so as we're scanning back and forth, here's the semi-T and here's the biceps. And we're going to see all this area through here really of, of disruption of that central tendinous structure. And so um, this will up, up our grade. Um, you can see, you know, pronounced hyperemia through this entire zone. And really we've, we've lost this structure right through here um, as we come down. So we usually have this nice hyperechoic um, aponeurosis. Now we pick it back up and then it's gone. And so we've actually extended through that region. Uh, and this is gonna be up in the proximal thigh. So just, you know, we're kind of seeing the, the biceps muscle here, right, just distal to its myotendinous junction. Uh, then obviously a four is going to be a complete disruption. And so here's going to be, uh, you know, th these are usually pretty obvious, um, you know, at least, you know, something pretty bad is going on. So here's the ischial tuberosity. Here's the proximal tendon. We see this large, huge uh, hematoma. Uh, again, we see these um, areas of retraction that have this pretty characteristic appearance uh, on ultrasound of these balled up um, edges as they start to come back. And then you can always use a dynamic scan here, which can help as well, um, looking at, at, at any motion or contraction across through this area. Um, and often we'll see these things kind of pull back and see that there's really no, um, really no connection here. In the acute phase, when you have this, this anechoic fluid, um, it becomes much easier as this starts to resorb. Um, and then you start to get, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, th this will start to get kind of sticky um, along through here as you start to get some early healing. Uh, and sometimes that can make things a little bit more uh, complicated than the subacute phase. Uh, but acute, these are usually pretty straightforward. So this is what I was mentioning in the subacute phase. And so again, this was a large zone of injury and we can start to see some, some organization and healing, but you can still see this large region um, of, of, uh, of injury here that then is starting, you know, so a lot of edema, we, we can see in you know, the nice muscle fibers here, all those are lost through this region, but that region of, of fluid and anechogenicity is now, is now um, resolved. We just see this little periphery we're starting to, to, to get some, uh, some healing along through this area. Um, we can still see this little peripheral zone, which is more obvious on the short axis here as well. Um, as you scan down, then we'll see in you know, these like little areas. So this is starting to heal. We can start to see this zone here. We see this small little area resolving hematoma. So this is kind of what that progression might look like um, as this is starting to heal up. Uh, and the last thing we'll mention that, that we'll see uh, at times and sometimes can be subtle um, will be a, what we call a scar reactivation. And so, um, you know, these injuries eventually will heal and oftentimes, you know, will we'll look relatively okay, but you'll still be able to pick up some regions of chronic fibrosis within the muscle, um, which looks like this. And so this is going to be what we see as we come down through the semi-T here. We'll pick up this zone right there. It should catch your eye. It's usually it's hyperechoic and you'll lose that normal muscular structure. And so you can see um, these regions of fibrosis at various areas. And if you look at a, you know, an elite sprinter's thigh, I mean, you'll see little regions of fibrosis all over their, their muscles uh, commonly. And sometimes these can, you know, react 
activate. So they might come in with an injury um, and, and you may not be overly impressed on your initial scan, uh, but you may see a region of fibrosis that then has some hyperemia surrounding it, which would be, um, you know, kind of an area that they, you know, they tweaked or reactivated this old injury, but they haven't retorn through anything. And so, so this is something else to pick up, um, you know, on your skin and these athletes, um, you know, a bit more subtle, but again, can be helpful in the, in the, uh, the return to play progression. All right, we'll mention briefly the, the other spectrum of muscle injuries. So though, obviously we've been talking about acute muscle strain injuries. So, you know, sprinting type mechanism. Uh, you also can have contusive injuries to muscle. Um, and these will have a slightly different appearance than our typical strain injuries. Um, this is an example of a quadriceps contusion. This would probably be the most common area of contusion that we'll see in sport. Um, you can see these anywhere, you know, that, that takes a blow, but, you know, at least um, in the U.S., you know, American football, uh, we'll, we'll see these with some regularity. Um, you know, sports like basketball, where an athlete may take a knee into the thigh, um, you know, this will happen relatively commonly as well. And so with the strain type injuries, those are usually going to happen in your, your muscles that are crossing two joints, right? So your rectus femoris, you know, your, your hamstring muscles. In the, the contusive injuries are usually going to happen on a muscle that lies in deep against the bone. And so in the thigh, that's typically the vastus intermedius, because as the force comes through, the force will basically be transmitted through the more superficial muscle. The vastus intermedius, your deep muscle here, is going to get all the force um, externally transmitted, uh, and then it's going to, you know, stop at the femur, and then, and then the muscle is going to get injured at that level. And so we can see the normal view here, where the vastus intermedius looks pretty similar to the rectus femoris, and then we can see this massive amount of swelling and then muscle fiber disruption uh, with hematoma here in the vastus medialis uh, consistent with an acute um, contusion with hematoma. These can unfortunately progress to develop myositis ossific hands, uh, and that's what we can see here. So we can see uh, hyper echogenicities um, just proximal or just superficial to the, uh, the, to the femur uh, with, some, with some intermittent uh, shadowing here. We can see that the, the muscles actually edema has improved, and so it's no longer, uh, you know, significantly larger than the rectus. It's, you know, nearly the same size now, but we can still see this region of uh, healing muscle injury where we don't have the normal muscle fibers. And so, so this is what we hope not to see, um, you know, with these, but this can be the, the progression and some things that we'll look for. Uh, with myositis, you can actually pick it up earlier on ultrasound than you can on x-ray. And so this is, um, in some of these injuries, particularly high risk, um, we're pretty quick to scan these, um, just to survey um, to see if we are starting to develop any, any of this in our athletes. Uh, here's another example uh, of what myositis ossificans may look like. This is a more extensive um, uh, development, and we can see all these hyperechogenic regions within the vastus intermedius, and we can still see some area of, uh, of uh, anechoic uh, compressible fluid uh, within this region as well. Um, this is just another view of that same, same leg, and we can see this whole area of ongoing fiber disruption uh, with the MO. And so we can see the, the myositis here is a bit better formed, and so this was was kind of recurrent injury in an athlete who had uh, had an injury, had developed myositis, and had kind of just continued to go back and forth of re-injuring this leg. Um, and we can see kind of multiple stages uh, of progression here um, with some acute muscle injury as well as some chronic myositis ossific hands. And this is an example of extended field of view imaging, which sometimes can be helpful, um, you know, particularly just in showing the athlete or the athletic trainer, uh, strength and conditioning staff, kind of the extent of this. And so we can see this long area of, uh, of muscle injury here with all this extensive myositis ossific hands, uh, as well as some, uh, some acute fluid and hematoma through here. All right, so let's move on, uh, briefly talk about intramuscular tendons in a little bit more detail, why these might be clinically important, and then we'll talk about a return to play uh, protocol here. So uh, with, with muscles, you know, most of us, at least I know in, in the U.S., you know, our, our understanding of muscles uh, and, and, and anatomy-wise was pretty, um, pretty remediary, and so we kind of talked about you know, there's a tendon, uh, there's a muscle tendon junction, there's a muscle, then there's a muscle tendon junction and a tendon. 
uh, and that's kind of how your muscles are supposed to go. Um, and you know, then we've already mentioned this kind of idea of grading. So you kind of have this grade one, grade two, grade three, and that's really, you know, kind of all there was to know about muscles um, for the most part. And I think that we really realize that that's not even close to true. And that's probably why we do such a horrible job in managing muscle injury and why the recurrent injury rate is so high. Um, and that really does a disservice to our athletes because these are extremely common injuries um, that are responsible for a lot of time loss from sport. And so, you know, more recently, people have started to get interested in the true anatomy here and the true injury patterns. And, and so what, what has been described is, say, take the biceps, for instance, you're going to have a free tendon, um, which is what we kind of refer to as the, you know, as the conjoined tendon and, and what most people, you know, call the tendon uh, of, the, of the hamstring complex. And then you're going to have this intramuscular tendon. So that actual um, tendinous structure will continue down into the muscle and actually forms a scaffolding uh, that these muscle fibers are going to insert on. You're also going to have a distal tendon, and that distal tendon is going to move proximally in, and so you're going to have these zones of, uh, of, of tendon within the muscle where these muscle uh, fibers and fascicles are actually inserting on. Uh, the rectus femoris is, is even more complicated, and so here we really have a muscle within a muscle, and so you have the direct head and indirect head, uh, and you have this, you know, almost two separate muscles that are then um, you know, incorporated into what we consider one muscle, the rectus femoris. And so, um, and then even within that, then there's going to be a central tendon within the central muscle. And so, um, but, but it's important to recognize the complex anatomy because that will really allow you to, um, to better define injury patterns and then ultimately uh, treatment options for our athletes. And so, you know, the, the, the biggest, you know, thing I think to take out of the kind of the complex muscle injury grading scales um, that I presented before, you know, is really going to be this thought of recognizing some of these intratendinous um, injuries and the, the um, you know, the possibility that the prognosis may be a bit um, protracted with these. And so, again, I mentioned before, this is, this is an area of controversy. You're going to get a lot of different opinions on this. Um, uh, you know, in the literature, but, you know, there is some literature to suggest that these intratendinous injuries are going to have, um, you know, a more delayed return to play. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, that, that we really not begin to explore the utility of ultrasound both in making these diagnoses um, and, uh, you know, you know, helping guide um, treatment options, you know, as well as we, as we can. So um, here's just several papers just kind of highlighting the importance of, you know, recognizing these intratendinous injuries. Um, and then more recently, there's been some, some, some move towards actual er early surgical management. So I think that's the biggest thing to take away here is, um, you know, is, is this may actually significantly alter your treatment options. And so, you know, historically people thought, you know, you, you don't operate on muscle injury because, you, you know, you can't sew muscle fibers together. Um, but all of that was based on, you know, this, this faulty um, anatomy that, that we thought we knew that we really don't. And so indeed, if you do have these intratendinous injuries, you're not sewing muscle together, you're sewing tendon back together, which we know can be very effective um, for, for tendinous uh, avulsions. And so, you know, this was a, a study looking at uh, repair of this proximal uh, aponeurosis between the biceps and, and semi-T back in 2015. Uh, and this study was, was literally just published in AJSM um, looking at uh, early surgery uh, for these myotendinous junction injuries of the proximal biceps. And really we're talking about this same zone uh, up uh, of these non-tendinous non avulsions, but really this proximal tendon injury uh, that you can appreciate on the MRI from their paper here. And so, you know, this was, was a series of 64 patients and they did, uh, you know, early surgical repair here and show that they were able to return athletes to pre-injury levels with a low risk of recurrence. And recurrence is really the name of the game with muscle injury because we know that recurrent injury is, uh, is very, very common uh, with most of these and, and typically results in a significant time loss for the athlete. So if you, if you try to pick this up uh, on your physical exam, um, you know, you'll, you'll find that it just doesn't work. And so, so this, this paper demonstrated that trying to look at flexibility and strength um, really isn't able to tell. And, and I'll tell you, at least from my experience, we, you know, we scan 
in almost all of these injuries now. And, uh, and I just don't find a correlation with, with, my, with any of my physical exam uh, and the actual structural injury of the athlete. Um, and I think this is why the recurrent injury rate is so high. I think these athletes can have a significant injury uh, and they can still perform pretty well uh, in the clinic. And so if you're, if you're doing basic physical exam maneuvers, even basic functional testing, they can, they can compensate and perform pretty well. Uh, and we really don't, don't you know, appreciate how extensive the injury was until they get back in like a game situation or really uh, back to full play and then they have a recurrent injury. Uh, and that's because that injury was hiding under the surface. And so I think you really can't rely on your physical exam, um, particularly in picking up some of these more significant tendon injuries. Um, so here's an example of, of what some of this tendon injury may look like. Uh, and the rectus femoris, the rectus is a great example of this because there's a very large uh, central tendon that runs within the central muscle, which we can see here. Uh, and as that gets injured, well, what's referred to as a bullseye pattern. And so this bullseye here um, is typical within the, particularly within the rectus, because we have the central muscle within the, uh, within the rectus and then we have the central tendon within that central portion of the muscle. And so uh, as we get, uh, as we scan down here in the cine loop, what we'll see is we have this central tendon and then it goes away. And then we have this, uh, this sort of um, mixed echoic, you know, it can be kind of hypo versus hyper, depending on, on how much is, uh, is edema versus uh, actual hematoma and what phase, but you kind of lose that central tendon that you normally should be able to follow through that region. Uh, here's a bit more subtle example uh, of a subacute injury um, where we really could just see this small zone of uh, anechogenicity within the tendon, uh, but we could confirm this on, on two views. And what can happen sometimes with these, you know, this athlete had been rusting for a period of time. And so sometimes these fibers, just as you'll see in other tendons, um, can have a, a more significant injury, but the tendon fibers are kind of sitting on each other. And so in the, in the subacute phase, um, if there's not fluid, uh, you know, kind of holding these apart, they can be difficult to pick up. But we can see here in a post-injection image, we put a small amount of, uh, of PRP in within this um, region, and we could see this just extend down this length of the muscle. So we had a, this long uh, kind of intratendinous, um, you know, partial longitudinal tear, um, which extended several centimeters down, but it was really not showing up uh, all that significant on our, on our imaging. And so, um, so certainly these, these can kind of hide out there as well uh, and, and really need a keen eye to pick up. Uh, this is an example, um, again, of a, a great example of when surgery should really be considered for a muscle injury. And so here we have a, a central tendinous injury in, in a, uh, one of our football athletes, uh, American football athletes. And we can see, uh, this is the rectus femoris here. This is uh, vastus intermedius below. And the long axis, we can see this area, complete disruption. Now, if we just look at this picture right here, um, and I told you this was an Achilles tendon tear, you know, I think most of you would believe me, right? I mean, this looks, this looks like an Achilles tendon mid-portion rupture. Um, and if we look at the short axis, again, we see this area just devoid of fibers. Um, but this is, uh, you know, is something that, that, you know, we considered doing a surgical repair on. And we can see the um, contraction testing. We really see no, uh, you know, no bridging fibers across through here. Again, this, you know, to me looks just like an acute Achilles rupture. Uh, we can see here there's contraction of the peripheral aspect of the muscle, uh, but really no contraction of the central aspect of the muscle uh, within the rectus femoris. Uh, and, and this is just, you know, not going to do um, great if we treat this non-operatively. And so we actually uh, repaired this surgically. Uh, we can see at our six-week post-operative scan, this actually looks amazing. Um, for any of those who have followed these off treated non-operatively, um, you know, this, this just looks remarkable. Uh, we can see a suture material crossing through here, but we really have, what, you know, this is very well incorporated. On the short axis, we can see this central tendon coming through. Here's our suture repair. Um, and, and this looks great. Uh, and, and patient was actually doing very well functionally uh, and was able to return um, to, uh, to football uh, activities. Here's just uh, uh, a cine loop showing contraction. And so we can see you know, nice restored contraction across that zone uh, of injury. This is a, an athlete who we treated non-operatively. And so um, this was a very protracted course. This, this probably took three times longer um, than, than our surgically treated athlete um, to get back. 
And we can see that although we've restored contraction on both sides, uh, you know, this isn't normal. And this is really about the best you can hope for in this significant of an injury. We can see this chronic defect. We've all probably felt this on athletes uh, who have this big divot in the front part of their thigh. And we can see the contraction just doesn't quite look right, right? And we can see the area uh, of kind of chronic fibrosis of the muscle across through here. Um, so clearly, you know, at least in this, in this, you know, in of one uh, anecdote, um, you know, the, the surgical uh, treated patient will Looks, looks much better uh, and functionally has done well. All right, last thing we'll mention here quickly, uh, we'll try not to go to go over here too much, is this going to be uh, how you can use ultrasound in helping return to play uh, from, from muscle injury. And so, um, so this is just a case that we saw again before, uh, a semitendinosus injury um, you know, that was, that was uh, you know, starting to come up along the tendon but not through. And so we'll come back to that case in, in a minute. And so, um, so as we mentioned before, recurrence is, is kind of the, the, gonna be the issue um, that we're gonna talk most about. Uh, in terms of just general epidemiology, um, I mean, muscle injuries are, are very common um, you know, in, in speed sports like track and field, uh, soccer and football, you know, they, they account for a significant number of total injuries. And so, so about half of injuries in track are gonna be muscle injuries. Uh, and, and almost the same in football, surprisingly. Um, and, and most of these are going to involve the thigh, and most of those are going to involve the hamstring. And so the hamstring is certainly a uh, very, uh, uh, very important consideration. As I mentioned, your recurrence is extremely high. And so depending on the studies that you read, up to a third of hamstring injury uh, may be recurrent injuries. Um, and most of these are going to happen within a month after uh, return to play. And so this is, I mentioned earlier, we're just really bad at picking up which of these injuries are, are ready to go and which are not. Um, and I think it's because our, our, our current physical exam and functional testing um, just really is enough to snuff and, and nor is our imaging prognostication. Um, we look at return to play, uh, it's difficult, it's difficult to study and it's difficult to report because there's not really a consensus on what this means. And so people say very vague things like reaching pre-injury level and able to perform, um, but, but there's not really any standardization in terms of what this means. And I'll tell you from, from my perspective as sports medicine physician, return to play often is dictated as much by where we are in the season. And so is there a big competition that's happening? Um, that's when they're gonna go back, right? because it's a muscle injury and it's not threatening their life. And so if they're good enough to go, they're gonna go. And so that's gonna really skew our data um, because I may have an athlete that misses six months from a muscle injury. Um, and that's simply because it was the end of the season and we went slow. I may have an athlete miss six days um, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're ready to go. It just means that there was a you know, Big Ten Championships that week and uh, we put them out there. And so, um, so these are things that make it, make it very challenging. Um, this was a nice, uh, a nice uh, paper from a few years ago looking at return to play and actually trying to come up with some definitions, which I thought were helpful. Uh, and they looked at what should be included in return to play. Um, you know, their, their definition here was the moment the player has received a criterion-based medical clearance and is mentally ready for full availability for match selection or full training. So I think this is a pretty good definition. Uh, of what return to play, what we could use for that. So basically whenever the medical staff hands it over to the coaching staff, um, and when, what they, uh, you know, this is an expert consensus. And so what they felt was important, um, you know, I, I won't necessarily disagree with, um, but again, it's a lot of the stuff here that I, I feel um, athletes can can probably pass and still have uh, still have some issues and so you know certainly I think we should be looking at all of these no doubt uh, one thing that they excluded was MRI um, and I probably agree with them on that um, but you know certainly my bias would be to include ultrasound uh, you know in here somewhere uh, and I'll show you why and so uh, we'll we'll just zip through this um, you know from from a clinical side. You know, there's certain things that we know may have worse, um, you know, prognosis or longer return to play, um, but we don't really stratify this group very well. When we looked at imaging, um, you know, basically studies out there have shown that, you know, if you have positive findings and it's worse, um, then they do worse. Yeah, it's not surprising, right? You know, if you have a large injury and big hematoma, um, those patients are going to do worse. And again, I don't think this is overly helpful. Uh, you know, this study looked at comparing ultrasound and MRI, and, and there was some disagreement. Most of it was on these mild injuries. And so MRI shows better edema. 
um, that's fine. Ultrasound and MRI were actually pretty good um, when we were calling true structural changes, and I think that's where the importance is. Um, but again, it's not really, in my mind, getting the whole picture. Um, you know, here is just a systematic review looking at the prognostic value of MRI in, in, uh, in uh, determining re-injury risk. And, um, and if we go, go back to that, you know, basically it just says that the current evidence doesn't show any strong um, evidence supporting MRI at baseline or at return to play in predicting hamstring re-injury risk. And, you know, and I, I would, you know, somewhat agree with that. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's again, I don't think we've maximized our use of imaging um, to really be able to allow us to do this uh, currently. And so, so what, what can ultrasound do or how can it help? And so I think there's a few things that are different about how we use ultrasound compared to MRI um, that can be helpful. You know, one is, is it can be performed by the actual team physician and, and you have the clinical picture um, and you have a little better understanding of what's happening with the athlete. Um, you can correlate this directly. You can do dynamic uh, scans. And I think this is all helpful and adds a lot to the interpretation as opposed to just looking at, at the MRI. Um, and, then, and then also experience here is really gonna be key. And so, so if you have the opportunity to scan your athletes a lot, and particularly doing repeat scans and serial scans, um, you know, I think you can pick up on subtleties that will be, um, you know, at least for me, are helpful in managing return to play um, that otherwise you may not be able to simply on MR. So, um, I mentioned Doppler before. I find Doppler to be really helpful in monitoring um, progression. Uh, it tends to be one of the last things that kind of resolves. And so this is a good marker um, for us, um, particularly in, in, in you know, allowing athletes to return to full unrestricted play. Um, I like to look at, at restoration and contraction across injury sites. So I showed you some examples of some, uh, of, of some of that. And, and it's helpful um, to be able to, to actually put these muscles in functional positions and have them try to work and see what's happening. Um, you know, in my mind, if I don't have bridging fibers across that are actually contracting, um, I, I'm not going to return that athlete to play. And you'll be surprised at how many athletes will come in um, that look pretty good on the pitch that, that really have no functional contraction across that injury site. Um, they're just using, uh, you know, they're just compensating. And then, uh, and then we can also, you know, potentially intervene. And so we're not going to mention too much. Again, this is a really controversial area, um, but there may be some some role um, for hematoma aspiration or, or orthobiologics uh, to help help with recovery. So, so my hypothesis here is that, you know, while factors associated with location and extent of injury are important, uh, and that's what you really look for on, you know, like like an MRI at baseline, trying to look at, at prognostication they don't really provide any information on how things are actually healing. And I think that, you know, athletes are going to heal at different rates, irrespective of the type and location of injury. Um, we see this all the time. Every, you know, it's not a one size fits all. We'll see this, you know, probably most, uh, you know, mo most notably with ACL injuries. You know, you see some athletes are back at four months and some you know, still aren't ready to go at two years. You know, we know that the same injury doesn't heal the same in every athlete. And so ultrasound has the ability to actually look at muscle healing and follow that along. Uh, and I think that this can be very helpful in standardizing return to play. And so this is, is what we published a couple of years ago. And this is what we follow for our um, athletes at the University of Iowa. Uh, we'll typically grade these muscle injuries out. Um, as I mentioned, about 48 hours for me is, is, is ideal. Um, if they have a large hematoma, um, we will aspirate that. You know, if, if it's small, we'll typically leave it alone. Uh, we may or may not uh, augment that with orthobiologics. And then we'll, we'll kind of send the athlete back to their, to their trainer to do our usual return to play. I found that if we keep, keep athletes under 80%, they're pretty safe. And so there's really not a lot of harm in terms of what we can do um, until we get above that. Once we feel like the athlete is ready um, to progress beyond that level, then they come back for, for repeat scan. And then we will scan them until, uh, essentially until I'm happy with the way things look um, and before we allow them to go back to, uh, to, to kind of full, full training and full availability um, with their coaching staff. And the things that I look for are going to be, you know, fluid, function, and flow. And so we're going to look for um, resorption of hematoma, restoration of contraction, and then resolution of hyperemia on Doppler imaging. And so uh, you guys have seen, seen plenty of these pictures now at this point, this big hematoma, 
uh, compressible within here. Obviously, there's going to be no contraction across the zone of injury. You know, this athlete's not ready to go. This is going to be, you know, initial scan. Here we can see, you know, the contraction studies. We see muscle moving around, nothing across this. This is pretty easy. Here we can see what that contraction restoration may look like. And so now we're starting to actually get functional muscle fibers bridging across this zone of injury. Uh, and this is, you know, for me, a prerequisite for, for returning this muscle to play. Uh, Doppler, I think, is going to be, you know, at least in my mind, the most sensitive thing here. And so we'll see this progression where there's a lot of Doppler flow at the zone of injury that gets less and less as things progress along. This will typically be the last thing to resolve. Um, but in my mind, that this somewhat correlates and is, is a surrogate for, for maturation of that muscle and healing. And so, um, you know, if you return an athlete with a tremendous amount of Doppler flow there, um, my initial experience has been that that athlete is at much higher risk than one where has, has uh, essentially minimal or no Doppler flow. And this can be helpful. Um, and this changes faster than I thought, you know, that this is something that changes week to week. Um, and can be very helpful in, you know, in telling an athlete, okay, you need just one more week here. We're almost there. We're just not quite ready. And you can show them what you're looking at. You know, they come in the next week. That's improved. Everybody feels good and everybody is ready to go. Um, we talked a little bit about this. I won't mention it again. So, so just to kind of kind of mention, um, you know, the, this back to this last case here, and then we'll go through through any questions. And so, so this was an athlete. You know, I showed you had this pretty significant injury. Um, this was before we were using our our scanning protocol. Passed all his functional tests. Everything was good. Got him back on the track. You know, a week later, comes back, re-injured it. And so now we have that injury where it was involving the semi-tendinosis proximally um, up, you know, with a partial tendon injury. Now they completely blew through, um, you know, complete uh, central tendon injury involving both the biceps and the, and the semi-T. Uh, and this completely, you know, lost the entire season. So he was out. This is a very significant injury. And this is one that, you know, in retrospect, um, you know, I, I'm nearly positive would not have passed our, our ultrasound protocol, um, you know, but, but functionally looked really good. Um, and then obviously just got back too early. And so this was, uh, you know, is what we try to prevent now. Uh, and I would say that, you know, it's, it's very rare these days that we have a situation like this where we, you know, have these bad recurrent injuries um, now that we're able to monitor these a bit closer and actually truly document the healing uh, as they move through the different phases. All right, guys. So that that's my whirlwind tour of uh, of muscle injury. Uh, how we're kind of using ultrasound to um, to help guide um, things along from the sports side. So I'll open things up to questions for anybody who has uh, has a few minutes. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Mederick. That's that was a very comprehensive lecture, very clinical and uh, very useful. Now I'm just uh, wondering. Uh, what kind of intervention do you do for, let's say, those types of muscle tear? Uh, do you do orthobiologics or you just uh, do physical rehabilitation or anything like that? Yeah, so we, we do um, kind of all of the above. And so we do some, um, we will do some orthobiologics for some of these athletes. Basically, my criteria uh, on when to decide to do that is if, if there's, you know, a significant disruption of the muscle and there's a free hematoma um, there, then I typically will like to aspirate that. And if I'm going to put a needle in to aspirate that, then I'm going to probably put some PRP in um, afterwards. You know, the data obviously, as you know, is very mixed uh, on if it helps or if it doesn't help. Um, in my experience, I've not seen it. Um, I've not seen any, any bad outcomes from it. And so I've not seen people, you know, develop myositis, ossific hands or anything like that, which, which some people have voiced concerns over. And, um, and, and anecdotally, um, you know, it seems like our recurrence rate has been a bit less um, since we've been doing this. Now, that being said, I'm also, you know, following them a bit closer and, and there's lots of confounders. But, but, you know, in my mind, if, if, you know, if there's enough disruption, uh, we are doing PRP. The other instance we'll do PRP are on some of those tendinous injuries. And so like that semi-membranosis membranous injury, I would definitely do PRP on that. Um, and in anything that's really involving the tendon, um, that's not a complete tendon injury, we typically are recommending PRP um, for those. I think PRP probably has a bit more um, 
a, a bit more advantage in with with tendon or fascial involvement than if it's a true you know peripheral muscle injury. I, I think those typically do fine without orthobiologics, honestly. Do you have any preference as to whether you're using a platelet uh, leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor, or maybe platelet poor? Yeah, so that's another great question. Um, so there's some some basic science to suggest that actually using platelet poor plasma may have some benefit here. Um, I don't think we figured it all out yet. And so what I do um, at this point is if, if it's mostly muscle, um, I typically use a, a bit more platelet poor plasma. Um, if, it's, if it's involving some of the tendon, then I use platelet rich plasma and use, I, I typically use leukocyte poor for everything. These are acute injuries. There's plenty of leukocytes around um, and I don't want to have, you know, any, any, any increase, uh, you know, pain or inflammation through here. So I'm using leukocyte poor, PRP, if there's intratendinous involvement and then typically platelet poor uh, plasma for straight muscle. Yeah. I see. There's another question here, Dr. Medorico. It says, uh, do you, what do you do for the first 24 hours? Do you do uh, warm, cold compresses, or do you still, does it really matter to use all those types of intervention during the initial stage of the tear or injury maybe? Uh, I'm sorry, I was just trying to look over. What, what was, can you repeat that question again, sorry? It's a, it's a choice between a heating modality or it's called uh, compresses. Would, would it help during the initial stage of an injury in the hamstring? Uh, com compression, you're saying? Uh, yeah, he heating yeah. modality, like uh, maybe uh, some people would like to do heating modalities over cold compresses. Yeah, or yeah. Biotherapy yeah. or... Yeah, so, so I'm a big fan of compression and we typically will do aggressive compression on all of these. Um, and particularly whenever you can see, you know, these, these hematoma, then seeing like that, I like to compress all of that out of there. Um, we, we tend to use more cold with compression. And so um, you know, there's various devices that we can use. We have, you know, pneumatic compression, um, you know, that, that we have in the training room. Um, but we'll, we'll be very aggressive with compression and in, as part of the return to play, most of these athletes will be wearing compressive sleeves and stuff, um, you know, typically for the, for the rest of that season. Um, I do think that's a very important component. Um, otherwise, modality-wise, I, I don't know. I'm not a huge modality person, um, you know, outside of the compression. I, I'm probably going to, you know, do a, you know, may, maybe a bit more of the cold compression over the acute phases, but um, I think the compression is really the key. Okay, thank you. Uh, you've also shown uh, in your slides, uh, especially uh, when you were deciding for the return to play, that uh, obviously there's, uh, there's already a connection between the tendons. Uh, are there other uh, ways of determining return to play other than just seeing that uh, muscle connecting to each other? Or, or would you really want this... Uh, fibers to be really connected to decide on whether uh, athletes would be ready to return to play. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that restoration of contraction across the injury is important. And so, you know, for me, in trying to look at, you know, look at all the things that we've looked at from functional testing to, you know, MRIs and, and, and everything else, um, and, and how poor that's, that's been in terms of actually prognosticating injury and re-injury risk, you know, I, I've not really seen people look at, at this and, and from a most basic standpoint, I mean, if the muscle's not healed, uh, I don't know how we can expect it to, uh, to not be re-injured, right? And so I think this is a big gap in, uh, in, in where we looked. And so, you know, if, if those muscle fibers basically, you know, are going to be contracting as, as part of their job. And if they're not, if they've not found a home and kind of reattached and have restored that contraction, um, you know, as soon as they get stressed and as soon as that strain, you know, extends outside of the muscle that's compensating, I mean, it's going to get retorn, it's going to get re-injured. And so for me, that I think is really the key component. Then moving beyond that, you know, then, then you can kind of decide how much further improvement you really want to see. And so you really want to see, you know, resolution of all the hyperemia, and um, in edema, you know, through the area or not, and what your threshold is for allowing an athlete back. You know, if I have a, 
you know, a, a, an elite sprinter who's, you know, basically going to be going, you know, 100% from the gun. Um, you know, I want their muscle to look really good before they're going back. If I have a football athlete, you know, who's unlikely to ever reach true top speed, um, they can kind of compensate a little bit. Um, you know, they might be able to go back with a you know, without a perfect scan and they might be fine. And so some of it will depend on the actual sport um, in terms of where, where you decide to, you know, to kind of draw the line. But, you know, but for me, returning an athlete who's not actually shown, you know, actual healing across that zone of muscle injury makes me really nervous. I see. There's another question here. Uh, are there sonographic signs to differentiate scar tissue from muscle tissue? Yeah, so, so scar tissue is typically going to be hyperechoic, um, so it's going to be a bit brighter. And, and the best way to pick that up is really on your, on your scan. So as you're scanning down kind of dynamically, you're going to lose that normal architecture of the muscle. And so usually normal, healthy muscle, um, you know, looks very regular. And as you're scanning through an area of fibrosis, typically you're going to start to lose that normal muscle architecture. Things are going to look a little, uh, a little disorganized. And then within the center of that disorganization, you're going to have a hyperechoic zone, uh, which is going to be representative of, of that muscle fibrosis uh, or the scar tissue. And so, um, so that's really what you're looking for, uh, this hyperechoic uh, you know, region of fibrosis. And then, of course, uh, the other, my big follow-up question would be, would that be a good thing if we have a scar or we don't like it? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I mean, it, it's just the way it is. I mean, I think with some of these, if you have large injuries, you're going to heal with some scar. And, um, you know, I, I think that's fine. Um, there's not much you can really do about it. Um, and so, you know, I think it is, it, it is just something to, to recognize and it may be as, as, you know, a stress riser and a you know, potential for some, uh, you know, increased, uh, injury risk through there, but um, but yeah, I think it's part of the nature of the game here. I see. There's one more question, Dr. Colin Chong. Uh, would you like to uh, ask this directly? Go ahead, Dr. Okay. Chong. Um, thanks for the uh, wonderful talk. Really enjoyed that. Um, from Australia, and uh, we uh, we do a lot of MRIs here as well as uh, ultrasound and uh, I uh, an institution where we sort of scanned uh, with them at the same time. Um, what, one of the things that I find that ultrasound is really good for is uh, ability to look for hyperemia and vascularity. Uh, and my first question is uh, regards to the word that you have to I use it for assessing muscle healing. I don't have any validated data, so I'd be interested to see if. Um, did you get the question? Uh, actually, he's asking about the shear wave elastography. Uh, what are your thoughts about shear wave? Yeah, so that's, so that's a good question. So, so we we've not done a lot with of elastography work. Um, you know, the, the soft tissue elastography, um, you know, packages in the U.S. have, have really not, not been indicated for a lot of MSK. And so uh, my experience has been in the, in the equipment that I used. Um, I, I've been underwhelmed by elastography's um, reliability. Uh, I know there are some units that, that are better than others, um, but I, I've just been underwhelmed with my ability to, uh, to really be able to get reproducible images. Um, I do think there's certainly a role in muscle for sure, probably, in my opinion, probably more of a role in muscle than in tendon. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping that we can actually do some look, uh, some work looking at that. We actually had a grant um, that we were going to be doing some elastography for hamstring injuries, and then, uh, and then COVID kind of put a Put a halt to the whole <laughs> the whole process. So so hopefully, um, you know, in a year or two, we'll. we'll we'll be able to actually have some data on that. But I know some folks do use this and, and there is some, you know, I think some promise of using elastography um, and that may add an additional component, right? And so when I developed my protocol, I tried to make it very practical. And so something that really you could do without fancy equipment, you know, and, and, and 
you know, e even on probably a handheld ultrasound machine in the training room, you know, you can look at contraction, you can look at Doppler. And, and I tried to make it something that was practical um, and I found it helpful. Um, you know, how much elastography is going to add to that? I don't know, but I definitely think it is a, it is a tool that would make sense here. And there's certainly going to be differences in elastic properties of uh, injured muscle versus healing muscle. And so, um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, but I don't have enough experience now. And uh, I think we'll just have to wait for, you know, wait for some more studies on it. I think we're quite similar because um, I, I find that it's very hard to reproduce it, uh, between patients. And you have to follow very strict protocol, as you alluded to. So it's, it's a little bit time consuming in the sense that if you want to be accurate, you, you have to really adhere to a strict protocol. Um, however, I think if you do it the same patient over time, that's what I found it quite useful for. And I agree with you as well. I think muscles are fine for tendons. They're quite useless. Uh, it's so variable. Uh, and, you know, you can't get the same three different vendors into the machine. Um, this is my experience. I don't know how to go to it. But, uh, but I, I think that uh, based on what I've seen so far, that there might be some promise. Um, I also use uh, low flow microvascularity uh, rather than uh, color. Um, is that something that that you uh, that you use your standard color and power Doppler, or do you go for something that you have? Uh, for example, Canon got the superb microvascular imaging, and G's got something similar called PDA. Uh, what do you what do you find using those sort of detection of low flow in in healing and and, uh, uh, and assessing response to treatment? Yeah, so I've um, so I think it's going to be very dependent on the on the ultrasound unit that you're using using, and so on my individual units, um, I found that color works great, and so I actually I have a Canon now. Um, so the other images I show were all off off of a Philips, um, and the Philips I found the the color for me was you know d despite what what we're supposed to know from physics and such, I've just found the color has been the most sensitive um, on that particular unit. Um, I, I was excited about the, you know, using some of the newer technology for the low flow on the Canon. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I've not noticed that it's given me any additional information than what the color has provided. And so I, I've been playing around and I'll click through different modes of, of Doppler. Um, but for, you know, for my purposes at this point anyways, I've not seen that any of the low flow, you know, technology stuff, the superb microvascular imaging and all that has necessarily added a lot. Um, it seemed to, at least in my experience, has been pretty consistent with just the color flow Doppler. Um, so again, I think something that, you know, we should probably look at a little bit more, particularly as this technology becomes a little bit more widespread, um, you know, and, and there may be something there for sure that might be helpful, but practically I've not noticed a huge difference at this point. I find the color is very, very good, even the older ones like IU-22. Uh, whereas with the, um, the Canon, for example, the R800 or the R600, uh, you have, uh, you know, the, um, the color and power is not very good, but the yeah, SMI, uh, uh, that's what SMI stand out so much because it makes such a big difference. So between some vendors, um, I, th I think Philips, you probably don't, don't need to get in. That should be actually really good uh, compared to some of the vendors that might need you know, something, some different other vendors that use low flow. But thanks very much for your uh, your input. It's really, really helpful and uh, really enjoyed it. And thanks very much again. Thank you. Thank you. One last question, Dr. Maderick. Uh, Ash, would you like to ask that directly? Go ahead. Good evening, Dr. Maderick. Thank you so much for this very comprehensive lecture. And uh, definitely Dr. John Finoff, who said so much about you when he was in the Philippines, really made us excited and we were not you know, frustrated about it. Anyway, uh, my question is, do you immobilize areas for orthobiologic, after orthobiologic injections? Does it work or does it have any role in treatments? Thank yeah, you. So, so that's a good question. So in terms, I, I don't like to immobilize um, strictly. You know, we, we know that, that, you know, most musculoskeletal tissues like movement um, and that's kind of part of the healing process. But what we do is we try to limit the extremes of motion based on the, on the injury. So say for a muscle injury, um, you know, if we do, you know, regardless of if we do orthobiologic treatment or not, um, we're going to try to keep that muscle within a, with, within a range where we don't feel like we're 
we're, we're you know, pulling those muscle fibers apart until they've healed down. And so we want to try to get early range of motion, restore some strength, and start to do some, do some isometric strengthening. And we try to keep them out of that end range, allow those muscle fibers a chance to, uh, to kind of start to heal. And then that's where we'll use the ultrasound to kind of progress them once we feel they're to a point uh, where they've healed enough, then we'll start to work that end range of motion. And so I, I personally, I think that doing a lot of too much range of motion early um, is like picking at a scab. You know, you're trying to get these fibers to heal and then you just keep stretching them back apart. You know, and I've actually seen that um, on imaging. And so, um, so I try to, to kind of find that, that zone where I feel comfortable with. Um, and allow enough motion to try to, you know, to decrease atrophy. But I, you know, I, I don't worry too much about, you know, not having that end range of motion because with muscle injury, it's not like, they, like a joint where they're going to get stiff or anything. I find that always comes back. Um, and so, so that's my approach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benedict. So thankful for your lectures. It was a really, really great lecture. And thank you for your time. I know you're very busy. I know uh, uh, there's a lot of things that you're doing, but uh, thank you for this time that you've given us to share your expertise, especially in this very important subject on the hamstring and uh, its injuries. So thank you very much and uh, hope to see you again. Yeah, thanks real. for inviting me. And everybody take care and hopefully, uh, hopefully the world calms down and I can uh, travel out to visit you guys sometime soon. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Mederick. And uh, just an announcement for everyone. Dr. Robert Monaco will be uh, giving his lecture tomorrow. So uh, I would like to invite all of you to please come at the same time, 8 o'clock in the evening, Philippine time. So uh, appreciate your presence here, Dr. Robert. And uh, hopefully uh, you take Good care of yourself be safe and uh, thank you have a good night and good morning to our friends in the u.s thank you thank, thank you, you